Welcome to the Roundtable Forum, the first one we've had for... Now, we did have one on the 29th of March on the war in Ukraine, but um, maybe that didn't go off like a rocket, so it doesn't really matter. You win one, you lose one, but that's another story. The Roundtable Forums have been going for 16 and a half years, this is number 55 in the Roundtable series of topical, high-profile, we hope, forums on the kind of issues that keep people awake at nights. I'm an insomniac myself, even without them. Most of them have been held at New South Wales Parliament House, and I can't be too close to this bloody thing. Most of them have been held at New South Wales Parliament House in the Jubilee Room, uh, and at the next forum, we're going to be back there. That's on the 20th of September, three months hence, and more of that later. Now, the topic tonight, as advertised, and I hope you're at the right meeting, is, <laughs> is euthanasia moral decay. At euthanasia dash moral decay. At the end of the word, at the end of moral decay, we have a question mark. So we're not making a categorical dogmatic statement. We're leaving it open. <coughs> to, to your judgment. The panel of speakers is Dr. Frank Brennan, Professor Margot Somerville, and Do uh, 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 Dr. Tamvir Ahmed, and Professor Margot Somerville. They'll speak in that order. And the questions are going to be invited from you, members of the audience, when all three speakers have finished, but not before. Now, our forums are sponsored. Western, by Western Heritage Australia. Now that's a discussion and study group aiming to raise consciousness on issues of interest to thinking people, which includes present company, or you wouldn't be here. Because there's so many other options, aren't there? All opinions expressed by anyone at all at this forum are entirely their own and not necessarily a reflection of the point of view of WHA, which is Western Heritage Australia. We're not endorsing anything that anyone says, speakers or audience, necessarily. We want to raise consciousness on this very important ethical issue. That's why we're here. We're not affiliated or connected to any other group, political, religious, commercial, whatsoever. In case you wonder, we're non-profit and all the donations that you've spent, hard-earned cash, are spent on the hire of venues like this one, and maintaining our presence on the internet, stationery, sundry, sundry things like paper clips. Um, we um, are non-profit. We encourage new members who share our point of view. And if you want to fill in a form and sign your life away, well, you'll, you'll, you could do far worse if you're interested. And um, you hand it in at the front desk. Don't hesitate. now. The first speaker in our panel tonight is Dr. Frank Brennan AM. Uh, he began his career in medicine, working both in Sydney and South Africa before he decided to study law while continuing to practice medicine. He embarked on a brief legal career before returning to medicine as a GP in the Aboriginal Medical Health Service at Redfern. Three years later, he decided to explore his growing interest in palliative care and started his training at the Sacred the, the Sacred Care Hospice at Dullaghurst at the time when there was a large number of patients with HIV and AIDS. He spent a year working in palliative care in Ireland before returning to Australia. Dr. Brennan divides his time between two roles with the Renal Support and Care Service at St. George and Sutherland Hospitals and Palliative Care Physician and Medical Officer at Calvary Hospital where he treats mainly motor neuron disease and cancer patients. He said palliative care had evolved to morbid care of the dying. Uh, my role in palliative care is to get you comfortable when people are dealing with life-ending illnesses and their, and their symptoms and giving them a good quality of life when it comes to time, when it comes time, dying with dignity and respect, he said. Dr. Brennan said, for motor neuron disease patients, the palliative care process begins soon after diagnosis and continues for the duration of the illness, which is an average of three years. Cancer patients may also be referred to palliative care straight after diagnosis, especially if they need help in dealing with pain and other symptoms. Dr. Brennan said kidney disease caused a myriad of symptoms and he worked closely with the renal support care team 
and Professor Mark Brown to ensure renal patients had the best quality of life. He said the lack of symptoms management and the bereavement support available now to palliative care patients were what he re remembered most when he thought back to his brother's death to the eyes of a 13 year old. I was 13 when Tom was ill and I was aware that Tom was going to die so I was very conscious of what was unfolding and what was being endured by my parents, he said. The former Australian New Zealand Society of Palliative Medicine president and council member is a member of the World Hospice and Palliative Care Alliance Board of Trustees. He's also a senior lecturer at New South Wales University and avid writer and author of two books, including Standing on the Platform, Stories and Reflections from Palliative Care. I'd like to introduce Dr. Frank Brennan, please. Look, thank you so much for coming here out on, a, on an evening, on a cold evening. And also, I wish to thank the organisers for um, bringing us all together. This is, this is very good. Um, I wish to start by acknowledging the, the traditional owners of this land um, and pay my respects to um, Elders past, present and emerging. Interesting, as I say that, I'm just very conscious that Margot Somerville, who will be speaking later, and I were privileged to attend the funeral of the late Sir Gerard Brennan, whose, whose funeral just occurred, and the acknowledgement to country there was given by Senator Pat Dodson, and he spoke brilliantly, not only acknowledging country, of course, but acknowledging um, the remarkable judgment of Margot. Okay, um, so let's perhaps start on this topic and I'm going to start just with a, a very brief scenario if you like because it, it's very good, we can, we can quickly get into the theory but I think it's good to think of things practically. A 69 year old man, um, he's married, he has three daughters and five grandchildren. He's been diagnosed with metastatic pancreatic cancer, a serious cancer. All his active treatment has finished. And he says to you as you sit by his bedside one day, I've had enough, I want the needle to finish it all. So, how do we approach that now and how does that, the law that's just changed, the new VAD law, uh, how will that change things? Now, when I hear that, that those comments, and it does occur, um, sometimes frequently, sometimes not so. To me, this is a remarkable moment where that person is exposing their sense of what's going on to them, their suffering. The last thing I'm going to do in that conversation is to speak about the law. What I am going to do is to ask why. What troubles you most? What's been on your mind about things? Why is it that you ask me for that. And to me, it, it's a revelatory conversation. It completely opens up the sense from that, from that patient as to what is troubling them. Is it that I'm suffering now and I've had enough of this? Is it that I fear that I'm going to suffer later? Is it that I feel I'm a burden to my family? Is it, look at me, I've lost all my, my dignity. My dignity is gone. People needing to care for me all around the clock. So with that, now, we start to open up that conversation. We start to talk through what is troubling you most. And we try and address those. And often, with that discussion, that, you, that seeking of, I want an end to it now, starts to fade as we, as we um, get to know that person better and as we start to think through that. And I think that that's a very important sense that this law has come into, uh, into our setting, into our, into our state, really, not in a vacuum. Often people feel, well, well, there was nothing there before, and now we have this law. Well, no, that's not true. Um, there is an enormous endeavour that goes on with patients, even in that situation, and not simply a closing down of the conversation. So. I'm going to talk about definitions because I think we, we probably should start the night with a good sense of definitions. One of the classic stories there is that, uh, what, that what we think is happening is happening already and we need to, to move away from that. 
So I'm going to talk about definitions. Voluntary assisted dying is an umbrella term looking at two, two as acts. One is euthanasia, where usually a doctor is, is giving, sitting by a patient and giving a lethal medication for a patient who is suffering. Physician assisted suicide is usually the doctor writing the script for the lethal medicines, the patient going and getting those dispensed, and they can take that uh, medicine at any time uh, they wish. So, so they're the two things. What is not voluntary assisted dying, and this is often a surprise to everyone, is the thing that's very time on it, that's been going on for really all of medicine, and that is withholding treatment, saying you don't have to have this treatment, it's okay, or well, the patient's saying no thank you. The second, withdrawing treatment, I'm on dialysis, I'm on blood transfusions, I'm ready now to cease this. Or well, withdrawing treatment is entirely within the law, even before this law came out, because it's, it's part of medicine. And also, symptom management that is proportionate to the symptom. Not excessive symptom management, not overdoing it, but symptom management proportion. So withholding treatment, withdrawing treatment, and symptom management that is proportionate to the actual challenge of that symptom is entirely fine and has been going on for forever. So often people think that VAD means withdrawing treatment. No, VAD means either euthanasia or physician assisted suicide, as I've said. So I think that there's two concerns perhaps in the public mind about understanding. The first is that the, 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 the people view VAD as the way to death without realising they already have a right to say no. They already have that right. The second classic uh, story is that withdrawing and withholding treatment is VAD. Well, no, it's not. And VAD is a huge change. So what we're doing is moving really from a state of the law changing, the law has been changed, the Act of the Parliament has been, and the Governor has signed off their royal assent. But what we're doing is moving from that very public domain, that very public debate, in the Parliament and the press and all of us in this room, into now a human drama that moves into an immensely private space. The encounter of a patient with a doctor or a nurse, founding that encounter is the law, experiencing that encounter are the individuals themselves. So it's a very different story, isn't it? So I think perhaps one of the things we probably should do is think about this story as law meets medicine. Law aims for precision. Medicine, on the other hand, operates in a landscape of uncertainty. So when the two disciplines meet to focus on VAD, there may be some problems. Those issues include the prognosis of illness, how long you're likely to live, decision-making capacity, screening for depression, the possibility of undue influence and pressure on patients, and the use of those medicines themselves. As doctors, we know we cannot be certain about these issues. The law strains to achieve but strains to achieve certainty in language and effect. The law seeks, but medicine cannot provide such certainty. And yet, both the disciplines of law and medicine seek that things don't go wrong, that things are not inappropriately done. There is therefore an inherent tension at the core of any VAD law, but also medical uncertainty sits there at the source of it. But not only medical uncertainty, but the mystery of the human psyche and interpersonal relationships, our sense of ourselves as human beings, our connection with our family, our connection with our past, and indeed, even in the last days of life, our connection with the possibility of a future, however shortened. Uncertainty and mystery are not necessarily good foundations for any legal statute. All the VAD laws have identical challenges. They have to work out the eligibility story. And I guess in this, um, in this Act of Parliament, they've talked about this, I won't go through them, but there's multiple aspects in terms of who you are to be able to seek a VAD. 
One of the things is prognosis, that you, you have to have an illness, a condition, that the prognosis is less than six months, except if it's what they call a neurodegenerative disease, like motor neuron disease, where it could be up to 12 months. <coughs> the difficulty with that story, and perhaps coming back to what the point I've made about uncertainty, is the challenge for medicine in prognosis. We know we don't get this right. Even the most skilled doctors are challenged by prognostication. We're not taught that well, and even the ones that are taught struggle with this story of prognostication. The next element there is, um, is undue influence or pressure or coercion. Now this is interesting. The law is saying, look, we can't have a situation where the child, the adult child, is standing over mum, you are going to have VAD. So the law is saying that. Absolutely it's correct, isn't it? We can't have a situation where people are, are being coerced. So you've got coercion at one end, the, the very strong um, overweening of someone's will to do this. And you've got right at the other end where there's no coercion, there's no, there's no influence at all, there's no statement at all from anyone. So the law sits here and maybe, it, and, and often it will be the other, way, the other side. But what about in the middle? What about other, I would call them, substatutory influences that can play on people's minds? which the law is not going to pick up, they're not going to say, oh yes, that's coercion, but st st still sit there. The feeling of, I can see it in their eyes each time they come and visit me, that they're, they're becoming exhausted with my dying process. It's the law, so maybe I should think about it. I'm re I don't think I'm worthy to keep going with this. I feel that it would be better for them if I went. Or statements made like, Mum, it may be best for you to have this. Now, we all wouldn't see that as coercion, but it's certainly an influence, isn't it? A substatutory influence, where things can come, and imagine if that's being said or thought about by a vulnerable person. The vulnerability may come from abuse in the past, a feeling of very lower self-esteem, a hovering but not directly in depression, a feeling that this is all too much. And what if that vulnerability or that, that sense of influence is coming because I can't find any palliative care doctor or nurse in my area. I'm in a rural and remote area. I'm in pain. The doctors don't seem to know how to deal with this. I can't travel to that area. It may be best if I have. So I guess that, that worries uh, doctors a lot, particularly people working within palliative care, that those subtle substatutory influences may sit there and trouble the person to the point where they may say, yes, I'm ready for the VOD. What about palliative medicine? Where does set that sit? What is palliative care? Now, if I was standing up here as a surgeon or a cardiologist, you'd have a fairly good idea of what I do. But many people don't realise the nature of our work, and I don't blame anyone. It's just the nature that this is a, a fairly uh, relatively new discipline, though it's growing in maturity. But also, we have let the ball down, our doctors, because this is not, up until recent years, not been included in training of medical students. So we've got generations of older senior doctors who've had no experience, no, no education in palliative care, who feel that palliative care is the following, only for the dying. That's a classic sense. But that's what you do, you only care for the dying. No, no, in the modern era, and really from its inception, palliative care could be involved in any illness, uh, any life-limiting illness, even from the beginning where there's, where there's a sense of of, of uh, symptoms or change or psychosocial distress. So palliative care is more than terminal care. The other classic thing, well palliative care is just for cancer patients. So all these other patients are not going to be able to get, well no, no. Certainly palliative care grew out of a response to what was seen as inadequate uh, management of cancer pain and cancer patients. But in the modern era, palliative care is involved in all life threatening illnesses. So I work very closely with a, a renal department for dialysis patients also with motor neurone disease patients, with liver patients, other of my colleagues, 
liver patients, cardiac. So it was really all life-threatening illnesses. It's not that. Also, that palliative care really doesn't have much to offer. You know, you, know, you might be okay with symptoms, but even that you may not do well enough. But certainly you probably can't deal with emotional anguish, the high distress that people deal with. Now, all disciplines have their limitations, including ours. But that story is a central part of our story, as it was with that first patient, sitting with a distressed patient, talking with them, working out what's going on, what possibly can we do for you? You feel you're a burden to your family. Have you spoken to your family about that? You feel you've lost all your dignity. I see you as a very precious person. You, you retain your dignity. I and my colleagues are never going to say goodbye to you. The principle of non-abandonment is very powerful in palliative care. We're here all the way through. We're not going to disappear. We're not going to come as some doctors do and say, look, there's nothing more I can offer you. We're going to continue on. But probably the best definition that I know is not an official definition, but was written by the great Queensland poet Bruce Dore. And his poem is remarkable. It's called Whitewater Rafting and Palliative Care for My Late Wife Gloria. If I had understood when down the years, so that when, if I'd understood when down the river you and I went swirling in that boat, that there are those who knew the ways of water and how to use the oars to keep afloat. I might have been less deafened by the worry, less stunned by thoughts of what lay up ahead, the rocks, the darkness threatening to capsize daily. If I'd only realised instead that help was all around me for the asking. I never asked, and therefore never knew, that such additional comfort could have helped me, in turn, to be more help in comforting you. I'd have found it easier then to simply hold you in, instead of bobbing the bo, sorry, I'd have found it easier then to simply hold you instead of bobbing to and fro so much. For it was you who seemed to be more tranquil and I who was reaching out to death. If I'd only had sufficient knowledge in that white water rafting, I'd have learned that there are those with us around with those with us with life jackets to whom I might have in that turmoil turned. Instead, because I had not thought of rivers or rocks or rapids, and gave way to fears that seeking help might make a man less manly and liable to betray himself with tears. I was less useful then, as twilight deepened, than I might well have been, had I but known. However wild the waves are all around us, no one needs to live or die alone. It's wonderful language, isn't it? And a great metaphor of illness, of suddenly losing control, suddenly in the hands of the doctors and the nurses. And on this, he's saying, no, but they do know the ways of water, and they, they know how to use those life jackets and those orders. It's also a poem of great regret, because he didn't ever experience palliative care. Had I but known, things would have been easier. Um, so I guess the other aspect perhaps to, to speak about is the, the, the story of um, junior doctors and senior doctors and how they may respond in terms of VAD. Because this is a, a very, very massive shift in what doctors and nurses can potentially do. From a situation where we would never consider taking someone's life, we are now in a situation from November next year, in that situation where, if all those criteria are fulfilled, a doctor could do that. And indeed, a nurse practitioner could do that. And I guess I do not know the hearts of all my colleagues, but I, I certainly would worry for them as to how that would be for them, even the most enthusiastic doctor on this, how that would be for them uh, doing, doing this. Also, interestingly, the law is tying my discipline into this. Well, not, not fully, but just, I'll just explain. Palliative care comes into the act in a couple of ways. First of all, if a doctor initiates a conversation, they can do so as long as they report to the patient that there is other options, including palliative care. Okay. Then, the, the participating doctors need to say to the patient, there is this discipline of palliative care and the likely options. The difficulty with that is that those doctors may have never had any training in palliative care, any exposure to palliative care, 
and how much information or the depth of information are they going to be able to give. Next, palliative care, uh, a referral to palliative care is not mandatory. Okay, so it is possible that a person would potentially with a life limiting illness may go through that entire VAD story without having had the experience of palliative care. The very discipline that is now that now attends to those very patients. So that's that's interesting, isn't it as well? That, that that's possible. I guess also then, but the law says something else. It also says that um, even if you were to be a conscientious objector and do not participate in this process, the treating team must not, must continue the same standard of care for that patient uh, throughout. So in fact, what may happen, and it may well happen in tandem, that you may have palliative care physicians exercising their legal right to conscientious objection and not being involved, but you may have the patient in the situation of, of pursuing the VAD, and it may all come to the one bedside. That's possible. The patient who's saying to their palliative care nurse, next Tuesday afternoon I'm taking the VAD medicines, you're a great friend of mine, and the help for my family, I want you to come and sit and hold my hand. That nurse may be a, a strong conscientious that, That's All those scenarios are possible. Um, and I guess we just need to be cautious about all this as, as things unfold. I'm, I'm conscious there are two other speakers and I need to, to complete now. So I'm just going to um, complete with just a, a one or two sentences here. Like all attempts to enact VAD laws, the New South Wales Parliament wrestled with the complexity of these laws. Eligibility, assessment and process. They were fated to do so. No law, and perhaps especially no law on this topic, can hope to encompass the limitless terrain of the human person and their world in the times of serious illness and the medical uncertainties that almost always accompany that time. Physicians struggle to deal with this ordinarily. The law is no exception. Thank you.